Hello. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for the introduction. Um, it's a privilege to be sharing some of my works here with the audience today, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to show a lot of projects so you can sort of get a sense of the way I think about making art. Uh, some of my most influential teachers were the conceptual artists Charles Gaines and Michael Asher, who I had the pleasure of working with at CalArts. Um, and they taught me how works could be used as a form of critique for the institutions of art, which I have tried to make works this way ever since, uh, but also trying to expand on not just the institutions of art, but to include other social structures. Um, I'll be sharing some projects that consider how a lack of information in the fields of linguistics, history, and conservation allow for other forms of understanding through artworks. Um, these projects will be, um, are not in chronological order because they were sort of made all at the same time. Okay, so like Meredith said, I've been working on this project in Oaxaca for the past 10 years, but just sort of finished right now, so it's fresh. And so I wanted to start with that. Um, I became interested in Oaxaca because it's one of the most linguistically diverse regions in the world. Um, and I also at the time was working for this architect and most of my coworkers were from Oaxaca. So they spoke Zapotec to each other often and I was very interested in what they were saying to each other because I mostly because I wanted to know if they were talking behind my back. Um, but Zapotec is a tonal language that's been passed down orally for over a thousand years and it has over 50 different variants. Um, and I had heard that people used to translate it into a whistled form during the time of the colony to hide it. Um, and I had heard some of my friends sort of whistle to each other, and I really wanted to do that. So I figured that what I needed to do to do that was to like, learn Zapotec and then learn how to whistle, and then we'd be able to communicate. Um, so this is after my MFA. So then I um, thought that maybe I could move to Oaxaca, but luckily LA being where it is, is kind of like north of Mexico. And so there's a giant uh, Zapotec community there and they were teaching Zapotec at UCLA. So I applied actually with my artworks and said, I wanna make this art piece to the Latin American Studies Department. And uh, they said, okay. So I um, went to make sculpture within the department. Um, and here's some of the works that I made during this time. Um, this is a map of all of the tones uh, that exist in the region, so I sort of wanted to see what it would look like. Um, and also because making sculpture is easier for me to study this way instead of normal style, because it takes a lot longer to make an object than to just go through a note card. Um, and so, but when I made this piece, it actually was starting to show like different sections of the geography that you wouldn't be able to see just by looking at the regular text, like just like, you can see that the clump of pins is like a giant mountain like that. So, so it was through making these works, it sort of revealed some other type of information that I wasn't able to see just uh, by looking at the lists. Here's a detail. So each pin is a different variant of a Zapotec language. Um, this is uh, for learning Zapotec verbs. I made this piece as all the verbs that are in the specific variant that I was learning from San Luc Quavini. Um, so at this time, um, you know how like you are in language class and you learn by subject. And so I, I thought that it would be easier to understand it if I organized it by tone. Um, and so here's, the verbs actually have more Zapotec than the nouns because the nouns have a lot of Spanish inside of it. And, yeah. um, so the verbs are actually the most closer closely related to the language before Spanish people came. Uh, and so this is all the verbs and it's or organized by tone. So the higher pitch verbs are up here and it sort of makes the scale. So it's like, no. Um, and uh, here's a close up. It's a Latin alphabet in the front and English in the back. Um, the interesting thing that was happening at this point was that my teacher who was at UCLA was making up these spellings because it's an oral tradition and now the, they're funding different um, sort of dictionaries of the variants. So he was in charge of writing, deciding how to spell things in his own variant, which was so closely related to drawing to me that it was like, you have this idea that is floating around in a sound and it's between like ABC and notation, like musical notation, like how will you do that, no? Um, 
So I followed him for a long time after that. But then, it, uh, then I made some other works that were during the whistling part. So I thought that somehow I'd be able to learn how to whistle properly. So these are some drawings of studies of how, and the description is how air travels through your body, how you have to form your muscle and form the air, and then it comes out as a different uh, language part. No? So it's, it, there's actually like 24 of these, but these are just three of the no finger, one finger, and two finger examples. Uh, so this is actually my dissertation, which is uh, just a record of translated Zapotec language into a whistle tone. So the way that I made that was actually to record my teacher speaking and then the sound wave that he was making I was able to trace with a bunch of like I went on YouTube and downloaded all of these like whistle tones and then just tracing the shape of the sound wave from one to the other because I really tried to whistle and I couldn't do it so like maybe I can get a professional like whistle person or I could do it but then in the way by doing it on the computer it made this uh, impossible version because only about 75% of the spoken version can be physically translated into whistle tones, but the computer can make 100% like same. No. Um, then I made a score, so to turn it back into some other playable form that an instrument can play. There's this uh, program called WIDI, which is MP3 to MIDI. Anyway, it's it's you can take a recording and it pops out a score. So that's what it, that how that was made. Um, right, like I said, uh, this is the dictionary that my teacher was, uh, ended up making. And during that time, it was like, really, I was really interested in thinking about how instead of a top-down sort of spelling, it could be an individualized spelling, because it doesn't exist yet. So why wouldn't anybody just be able to come up with these forms that represent whatever the language means for them? So I went around Mexico and made this project of public signs um, of uh, Oaxacan establishments, and I asked people to be like, you have all these signs, how do you spell, like, can I translate them for you? And they're like, no. And so I was like, it's not, a, you know, um, and so it took a little while to convince people that it, wasn't, that it was free and then that it wasn't some sort of like, I don't know, people, it's a lot of convincing for uh, that to happen. But, um, but in the end, once I convinced one, then all of them just sort of came afterwards and were like, can you do my store and whatever. Uh, and so then the, the, the people who work in these stores actually decided themselves how this was spelled. So I, I was hoping that somebody would say like, here's like some drawing or whatever, but it ended up defaulting to like ABC. Um, here's some more. So this is like permanent installation in this cheese store, which I really like to think about. Um, so then I also started looking at different um, texts that already had this carving before Spanish people came and crunched everything with uh, Latin alphabet. Uh, and then there were these stones that have these undeciphered um, characters. So, so mostly in, I guess they're in the museum in Veracruz now, but along that section, I just wanted to see what the, the language sort of looked like before, before what it does now. Um, this one is the Cascajal block. It's actually 900, supposed to be 900 BC, which is the oldest text in the continent. Um, and I also was thinking that it's like these shapes also have this ancient meaning that nobody knows, but also that looks like the ghost from Pac-Man eating an ice cream to me. You know, like 20 and 21, and like some mail, and like it was interesting to see how these forms that have this original idea could also have a meaning for, pe for people today. Uh, so this is La Mojarra Stella, which is uh, my favorite rock of the time. Um, it was found in, in 86 by a guy who was just fishing in the Papaluapan River, uh, and then he just sort of felt something smooth and came out with this like amazing example of uh, the Otomanguen language. And so it has all of this text that is carved onto it. You can't really see on the, the far side. 
um, which are the, this is the stone that I based my uh, next projects that were shown at the Whitney. Uh, and I wanted to make works that uh, could be a different way of trying to understand this text. Um, so this is the installation shot of the four ways that I sort of try to understand language. The first one is uh, looking, it's um, La Mojara Stella and its shape. So it, it's a two-part piece that is the, the drawing backdrop and the box in front of it, which you look through and it has these plexiglass, plexiglass sheets that separate the individual shapes that exist within the text. So like all the squares, all the circles or whatever. So the idea was that you could pull one out and like look through it and then just find all of the circles that exist in this text and maybe find a pattern or something. Uh, but in this way, I also was thinking that the same as when I was in school, that is like the process of making this drawing and making this like artwork took so long that I know all of the characters already. So you no, know, it's like this one looks like it's so many different animals or shapes that repeat. And um, and now with this like uh, screen thing, it was sort of like find all the squares. I don't know. This is a uh, you can. To be able to see the, the white is sort of the, the text. I enhanced it so you could see in the, in the drawing better than the original stone. No? Um, this is number two, which is uh, La Mojarra Stella negative space, uh, which is based on this idea of the obsidian mirrors in Mesoamerica. So in Mesoamerica, they used to use obsidian mirrors to find something that you didn't know about yourself. So I thought that it would be like how to use methods that existed a long time ago to try and understand something about the language. So the, the, the object in front of it is all of the parts that have been damaged out of the original stone. So they, the holes that you see there are sections of the rock that don't exist anymore. And I thought that it would be sort of performative piece where the object is looking into this mirror and is trying to be like, what is missing or something. You know? forever. So in this way, I was thinking that the viewer for this piece, the, the, the function of the piece was for the audience to look at the object looking, like performing this action. Uh, and this is the third one, La Mojarra Stella illuminated text. So this is the actual structure of the, I, I made two twins, they're sort of twins, um, pieces that, um, one is this illuminated text that is made with uh, reflective glass beads on the canvas, so it's very hard to see when it's not lit properly. I thought that it would be an invisible thing, and then when it's lit, it makes this like flash. You can, I tried to, this is my studio, so I tried to flash it, you know, because it was very difficult to see in the actual installation because the light is very even and nice and it's not like dark or whatever. Um, but this is the set structure that this works exist in, the text exists in, and the cousin of the twin of it is this piece, which is a La Mojarra Stella incidental conjugations, which is the text separated into the shapes, and it's a piece that rotates, and the text is, the characters are supposed to fall and make these sort of random connections that you you um, couldn't come up with. So the idea of them being together is uh, to show the the set structure and this random one together. Yes. So this is the Papaluapan River, uh, which this is where this rock was found. And so recently, I've made the second part of this um, project, which will be shown in Oaxaca later next year, which is to go to this river and then, um, so the, the, the installation will be a two channel video. One, which is a video of the fake riverbed that I made in my bathtub a long time ago when I thought of this project. And then this other would be the real one with a video of the riverbed in the actual river. So. Um, they actually look very similar to each other, but I, I haven't edited it, so I have just the, the video of the tub. It's just muddy water and rocks. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and so then the, the other part that it's gonna be shown is these, these stones that are made out of the same material as the 
the Stella, uh, because this, since this is one of the most polluted rivers in the world, like I was interested in how the acid in the river would erode the top layer, which is the text, which is actually the important part, but then how the river would decide to make it back into like a, just a regular rock, you know? Um, Yes, so while, ma while making these works, I've met a lot of conservators all the time because I just wanted to figure out how to technically handle artifacts if I found them. Uh, and luckily at the Fowler Museum is where they have in the basement the Getty Conservation Institute where they teach conservators how to deal with antiquity. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna just go and stock them and like figure out how to you know, build sculpture using these techniques of conservation. Um, and during this time, I was invited to make a project at the Hammer Museum, which if you know in LA, there are two museums that are both connect, Hammer and Fowler, which are cousin museums, but they never talk to each other, like the Contemporary Museum and the Ethnographic Museum, even though they're like two blocks away, never communicate. So um, when I was invited to make the show, I was like, can I get like full access to your collection just to find something in there? Um, and not really knowing what I would find, I just found this, uh, I went into the collection and found a shelf of like random objects that had lost their cataloging number, so they had no idea where they came from. It was like this limbo shelf that was like, Africa? No. Bali? Maybe. You know, so it's like this, this trash shelf full of um, objects that had the projections of curators and conservators through time sort of editing each other, you know, to be like, maybe this was African, and then it's like, no, actually, it's Bali. So all of them had this sort of really interesting way of seeing history unfold itself through projections of what it is, no? So this is actually a mud ring, but I don't know, maybe it's African. Um, so this is the, the installation shot at the Hammer Museum, uh, which I borrowed all of these objects and then made, the work was, consisted of making reconstructions based on these notes that the curators, conservators had made. So it's like we have this sort of professional uh, projections and then what does the object look like based on these things, no? Um, and so this is, um, this is one of them, which is a triptych, is the, the, the blue base holds the original artifacts and then the reconstruction is the ceramic, and then the drawing is a record of them being together because I couldn't actually install it into my piece. Um, but this one actually was, came with a story that the, the collections manager told me that the, the Fowler actually had a ceramic, uh, that there was this collector one time that had a ceramic in his house and he just put all of this trash inside of it and donated it to the Fowler like that. So when they got inputted into the collection, the trash inside became part of the work because they couldn't separate them. And then years after, the ceramic got lost. So all they had was this trash bag full of stuff that said belonging to a ceramic. And so that's what the reconstruction was based off of. I made the ceramic that actually physically makes the piece belong to it. And the drawing is um, a record of them being together because now after the show, a third of it, the, the artifact section, went back to the Fowler. And so I'd like to, and this is sort of the beginning of thinking about how you could never really own an entire work of art alone because a third of it would be somebody else's or something like that, separate them. This is like a grass that was part of a bigger grass. So any random shape, bigger grass would be fine. Um, and then here you can see the, the mud ring, uh, which had mu a wood fragment inside of it, so it, belonged, it was attached to a piece of wood at some point. So any shape piece of wood that's bigger fits, no? Um, this is 20 textile fragments stitched into netting in bag reconstruction. So I was interested also in textiles because there's these uh, fabric fragments that the conservator stitched into a net to, to conserve. And so by doing that, he actually has made a new object where he has made a new fabric and decided this random pattern. And so based on this physical object, I made the reconstruction, which is just a repeat of that pattern based on what he, she made. Um, this is two rocks, one pumice split in half. Uh, one generic rock, no date reconstruction. So this one had a, a post-it note. These two stones in the collection had this post-it note that says two rocks found on shelf. 
doorstops, question mark. So somehow maybe it was like the doorstops of the office that made it into the shelf and then they became antiquity. Uh, and so then I made this piece that was actually an actual doorstop that holds the rocks inside of it and then you can use it. Um, but the most, for me at least, the most interesting part was the document that was made when they loaned these objects from one museum to the other because the curators, the staff had to come up with uh, insurance form, so assign value and information that didn't exist before. So a lot of the, what ended up happening was that through our conversations, all of these facts were made, like we made them together and some of them like don't even make sense. So like, for example, this is like one bag with crumbs with post-it. Now it's just a, and so, so some of these projects also was like, why do you even have some of this stuff? And so I was thinking like, there's this bag full of breadcrumbs in the collection. And I was thinking like, maybe it's trash. And then the, the, the staff would say like, well, you know, somebody put it in this collection for a reason because it probably was the breadcrumbs of King something something that is now, you know, we don't have the technology yet to be able to fully know what it is. So we have to keep it. And really like with gloves and everything, you know, climate controlled breadcrumbs. Um, uh, and then the second one in the middle is called January's Fertility Belt. January is the curator at the, at the Hammer who came with me one time and she had mentioned that this belt looked like a gift that she had received when she was pregnant. So now officially it's called her fertility belt until somebody else comes up with the technology to find out what exactly it is, no? And then the third one is, the example is one that I made which was this rock with a hole in it and I just, rem it sort of reminded me of the rock that you know the movie, The Goonies, that you look through to find the treasure? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a reconstruction. You look through it just like the movie, so now officially it's called The Goonies Rock. Um, so at this point, I really got into these forms, and so I was trying to figure out how to make meaning, just like, like what are the different forms that assign value to different objects? So then I made this work on paper that, you know, I've been collecting all of these um, uh, Southwest artifacts, because I'm interested in sort of the difference between like Mexican law and US law and how artifacts just change inherently because it just happens to be like one inch on this border or this. Um, and so I, I haven't formulated it together, but um, this work was just about forms and how the forms could shape what, like what people would think about the shards. So I bought these shards on eBay and it's really funny, the description was like, they're not as, uh, something like, they're not as nice as they were when they were first found or something like that. It's like, they're really old. Um, and it came with the certificate of authenticity, which looks medium, uh, which says that is 900 AD, you know? So it's like, okay, that is the date because there's no more information. So do I trust it or not, no? So then I, I took it to, wait. Yeah, I took it to the conservator at the Getty and was like, how do you reconstruct this piece of broken pottery even when, when you're missing information, how would you even do that? Okay, so before I say that, the work on paper is, uh, consists of the images and also this essay by Frank Montero which is about the ethics and policy and conservation. So it's basically when you have no information, how do you make reconstructions for history? Um, so then here's some images of sort of like how the process of old style conservation uh, documentation was, and then he made all kinds of tests. I was trying to figure out like the machine, like XRF or something, that you like shoot or something, and then it comes out with all the chemical composition of it and carbon dating and all of that. But uh, again, like one of the biggest challenges was just to convince him to make the test because it was like so obvious to him that it was like, of course we can't do it. But I'm like, I sort of want to see through paperwork where the limit of your like science is, and then there's nothing else, and then I could do my project, no? Um, so then he gave me this condition report with at the, at the bottom he explained to me that there's no other shards to mount meant that that was the end of sort of science, no? Like there's no bits to mount so that's the end. So then I made this sort of blob reconstruction. That is, I, I think of them as sort of like a placeholder until there's a way to figure out how um, it was originally and I think abstraction is really helpful to understand um, because there are many uh, reconstructions that happen, but I have, I, you know, it's, 
with abstraction, it's easier to think, to see how it would be impossible to actually know what something looked like instead of trying to make a shape that would be similar to what a pot or whatever. No? Um, and so then here's the, the work. It's called Reconstructed Southwest Artifact. And it has, um, and then I donated it to the Hammer, which is a contemporary museum, and they have no antiquities in the collection. So when they accepted it as a sculpture, it became, it became a new work of art. Because it was a, a, a reconstruction all along until the building and this paper said that it was a sculpture. So that's why this, this object has three dates. It has the 900 which was from the eBay, and then the 2015, which was the reconstruction date, and then 2015, the sculpture date. Um, that's what that was. So now it's in the hammer, I like, okay. And I was thinking, oh, maybe if the Fowler borrows it, then it'll go back to being an old timey or whatever, no? And then I made one for the Whitney, so now the Whitney has an antiquity in its collection. Um, this was a piece uh, that was installed at the last Whitney Biennial. Uh, my friend Rafa Esparza made a brick, uh, Adobe brick installation, and then invited me to make this piece in, uh, put this work in it because it probably the shard existed in an Adobe building if it's from the Southwest. So we were like, oh, matchy matchy. Um, so this is a project that was similar to that in, that I made in the in France in the frac in Nantes. Um, and I had been to Marseille a long time ago and had collected all of these um, for a residency and it just so happened that the building next to the place where I was staying was a construction site and you know Marseille is one of the oldest towns in Europe and there was all of the ceramic that they were throwing away because it was like everywhere. You know? And so then I went over there and like dumpster dove for all of these pieces of ceramic and then I was talking to the, the, the people who were throwing them away. It's like why are you throwing all of this ceramic things, no, and they're like, if we try to keep everything, then we would never be able to build anything, so we only keep the ones that we find that are perfect, no, so I'm like, okay, sweet, mine, no, but then it turns out that when I actually, you know, I saved them for a long time, and then years later, I made this project, uh, and then it turns out that I can't make them because I can't own them myself, so this was part of the beginning of to think about how the law uh, came into conflict with the project that I was thinking and also actually made it more interesting. Uh, and so this piece now as it exists comes with this legal document that means that I can only own a third of this piece. The French government owns a third and then a third is owned by the property owner of that site because it, legally it's divided like that. If you find something you can't own it altogether. So actually it's in the collection of the frac now because it can't leave. No, nope. Unless we all agree. Like okay or I can maybe buy them out, I don't know. Um, so then this project is also has this 1.5 project attached to it that was about provenance in slow motion. And so in the, in the document, um, every time that any of the ceramics is shown, whoever shows it has to contact me and then I will make a real an analog provenance picture of it in this new setting. So this is the first time that one of them was shown, which was, uh, I can't remember which. So it was shown and then like the tomato and this purple thing were pieces of other people's work in that exhibition um, because it was this current setting. And then the next one was in the show in Korea where people's other work around it was there. Um, so it's sort of this uh, slow motion provenance through drawing. It just so happened that like another artist that I know was in both shows, so two parts of her pieces are in both. You know? Um, okay, so now moving on. This is one of my favorite rooms ever. So this is the Art of the Ancient Americas galleries at LACMA. It looks interesting because it is installed in a Jorge Pardo installation. They commissioned an artist to make the display system for these ceramics. Uh, and during um, the, the Getty PST, I was invited to make three shows. So I made them all about this collection. Because I really, you know, growing up in LA, I had gone to see it, and I really was like, if I make works about it, I will memorize every single mini thing about them. And through the process of drawing, I did that. So I drew all of the 300 uh, objects that are in the collection. And actually, I separated them because uh, they were all clumped down as like um, South, uh, 
They were all clumped down as West Mexico ceramics, but really they came from three different states. So then I separated them by state and then tried to see if they would be any different. So the, the first one is the Jalisco index. And actually they're to scale, so I wanted them to be like in the future, hopefully mirrored and installed in front of each other. Um, this is uh, the first project I made was the Jalisco index and it was works that were uh, responding to different, like the, t the, the title that the people, the, the uh, people in the museum had given them. Cause it's like, how do you name objects that you have no idea like what the original shape. So I made uh, this uh, joint decouple, which is based on this uh, second piece, which is called a joint couple. You see it in there? So they, it's called a joint couple, and so I made a joint the couple. Um, this one is based, uh, three works based on general shapes that I found. So there's a lot of dogs, and then a lot of gourds, and a lot of acrobats. So I thought, okay, what are the dogs in my life, and the gourds and acrobats that I see? So somehow to be able to make works that mirrored whatever they were trying to show in today's life, you know? This is number two, which is uh, shown in Mexico City Labor as a Nayari index. And this project was about the, the known provenance of these pieces. So they were in a grave originally. So I made a photorealistic picture of the grave because it's in the dark and you cannot see. Um, and then I, through interviews, I heard that you know it had been um, shown in mantles all over the world. So I made mantle drawings of hypothetically what they would be looking. And at this time, curators were emailing me all of these pictures of these ceramics in different home settings, which was really bizarre because people are crazy with their ceramics. No? Um, but that's what it was, a home setting. And then for the future, one of the, the curators had also told me that one of the biggest challenges is the lack of provenance and documentation. So I made these general shapes for the future which have a GPS attached to them. And every time they move, you can see exactly where they've been. You know? So for the future, they will be like recording their location. Um, and the third one, which was the main one that I, which was uh, shown at LACMA was the Colima index. Uh, and this project was about the naming of the collection because when I went to this room many times, I noticed that the, you know, the, the collection is called officially the Proctor Stafford Collection, who was the man who uh, bought, uh, sold the collection to LACMA in the 70s for about $3 million. Um, but in the stipulation for the sale, because you know Mexico changed their laws and then you were not able to buy artifacts during the 70s, it was 60s. Um, he was able to ask for some crazy stuff like every time that these are shown, his name has to appear next to it. So when you go into this room, his name appears 300 times. So I was thinking, oh, maybe the show is not about the ceramics, but it's about this man who is also interesting. You know what I mean? So I thought that it would be uh, that also the provenance hadn't updated because it's the, it said that it was the Proctor Stafford collection, but LACMA bought it, so now technically it's the LACMA collection, and so the naming should go into the near history, no? Uh, but through these contracts, that's sort of where the conflict was because it was like, first of all, I couldn't see the contract, and then I couldn't see how this was, how he was able to do this crazy loophole to have like a permanent show at LACMA. Also because in interviews he was an artist before he was a collector and he had said the way that I put these objects together is the first time that these objects had been seen as artworks and not as ethnographic objects. So he did like a total Duchamp move where he was like art and then put my name next to it into a permanent show. So it was like did you just do like a loophole to have a permanent show at LACMA forever? Um, so then the piece that I made here was to try and figure out how to separate the, pu the private name from the public collection, uh, which was very difficult because I don't, I don't, I'm still trying to figure out, there was all these like sort of ways to, uh, you know, bypass law, which we tried to do because for example, like he didn't specify what color the, his name had to be in. So maybe we could do it white on white and then you couldn't see it or the size of the font or whatever, you know, these, these sort of ways that his name would disappear from it in a way. Another way was to, there was another museum friend that I had and, and a way to deaccession, to actually separate the name is to deaccession the collection 
to improve it. So in museums, when they have two of the same thing, they will actually deaccession one to get a better one. But they don't say what a better one is, so I thought that maybe we could deaccession everything and get it right back, and then it would be a better piece with the name removed, no? No. I tried, I really tried. Um, Okay, but actually something did happen. So the, the, the piece also came with this letter to the curators, which was like, how do you separate that? Like, let's think about it, no? Um, and one of the things that, hap that ended up physically resulting from this work was that when you went into the LACMA website, the button to find the ceramics said the Proctor Stafford collection, not the West Mexico ceramic collection. So it was a really sort of like order of information that was very revealing to me that it's like the priorities of the institution just comes like uh, collector first and then what it is. Because if you don't know him, like you're looking for a ceramic, why are you not just ceramic to begin with, no? Um, so they changed the button. <laughs> so this is actually part of the work that I wanna do here that is sort of to look into different collections in the country just to see sort of what regulations stick and why you know, I don't know yet what it is, but it definitely has to do with law. Um, okay, so at the, uh, uh, a couple of months later, later at LACMA, they had this show on new finds of Teotihuacan, and then they, I saw these like two Stellas there that were so odd. And so, because you know, at this time, the, the objects are carved and very detailed. And so then I was like, what is it? And so the, the curator told me that they had just found these inside of the Pyramid of the Sun, so I made a project about uh, mediation of human, of, not human, mediation of the sun, with the, with the sun, of the sun. Um, and so for me, uh, it was, obviously these rocks were important to somebody because they were like, somebody took a lot of energy to put them up in the pyramid inside where no human actually would see it. So in a way it's like, by removing them, maybe something has been disturbed and like taking the batteries out of something, or who knows, because the, the site is actually a ritual site, so in terms of dealing with the afterlife, its actual function is still happening, you know, because the ritual, the sort of spiritual world continues and it doesn't stop, no? So this is a picture of the, the rock in its place before it was taken out and the hole that it left, another one. And so I, uh, I made an of, uh, official replica of these rocks uh, I had to get a permission from the government because Mexico owns the copyright of all of its antiquities, so it has to be licensed. And so there's other, another legal document that it was like, how can a country take the place of an author? Um, and it comes with this letter that it, the stones will be donated to the government, so they put it back in the hole to refill, reconstitute the ritual elements of the Sun Pyramid at Teotihuacan. This is what the sun looks like with your eyes closed. Uh, and then now it's like sort of science. <laughs> I put, put some science works. Uh, uh, so this is a sculpture that only is a sculpture when the sun reflects on it. So I was thinking of this temporal works that would exist as a prop and then only when the third element comes that you can't control, it would be that time when it's a sun. And also I was thinking about, I read about Archimedes' death ray and I was like, I really wanna try to figure out how I could burn, you know, burn something because so much of conservation is about trying to preserve things, but I was like, maybe it could be interesting to see demolition or breaking down of things, no? This is an exhibition of the the three works of the sun together, no? Uh, that's a big drawing of the, the inside of the pyramid. So like the perspective of the rocks inside. Uh, this is a piece uh, untitled Efflorescence. So this is another sort of demolition uh, experiment that I did. I was invited to make this piece in Mexico um, and it's, it's installed on the beach in Jalisco with a third of it is in the, oh wait, I had heard that um, Long time ago in Mexico with official buildings, you couldn't remove them. So then people who owned the property would put tiny holes in the wall and put salt inside of it. So then the salt would break the concrete and then the building would collapse on its own. So I just wanted to, again, figure out how long that would take. And when I got invited to make the show, I made this wall that is a concrete and it's um, saturated with salt. So when the, a third of it is under the sand and when the tide comes in, it suctions the water and the salt dries on it every day. 
uh, and it was supposed to eventually fall apart, no? But it got taken down by humans, but <laughs> this is a picture of it. Ah, yes, great. So this is also another piece that I recently made, uh, which is a piece of alabaster, and it's, it's, it's got a drop of water, and when the water in the surface dries, it, the next drop falls, and then slowly it's making a hole, so the piece will expire when the hole goes all the way through. Um, which is interesting, because now I'm going to briefly talk about my show at MoCA, which I've never curated anything before, but it had this idea, this sort of ideas of how a work of art never, like, is always changing depending on the framework or the material or other things you can't actually control as an author. So this is a, quickly, so the first four works are changing shapes on purpose. This is Walid Beshti. Uh, FedEx large craft box. It's a piece where you, it's a glass piece that gets mailed. So every time it moves, it has to go in this box and it's breaking and the stickers have to be added onto it. So the purpose of it is that it will be destroyed quicker. Um, this is a France West um, made, uh, provisorium. So it's made out of silver leaf, which reacts to all kinds of stuff in the air. So every time that it's actually on view, it gets damaged. And uh, when you clean it, people remove tops top layer, so it's getting thinner and thinner. Um, this is a Solowit fold for JB. Solowit made this like fold pieces for his friends, and it was just like a piece of paper folded, and it's like, ta-da, art. No, but then uh, the one that he gave to Baldassari, when it was getting framed, got lost, so then Baldassari was like, oh shit. I, so he, Baldassari sent Solowit this letter from the framer where he's, they say, oh, it's, it's, it's lost, and so, so Lewitt folded that piece and that became the new folded piece. So it's sort of like, who cares if it got lost because now this paper is the new piece. Um, because the work is in the seams, I don't know, is the seams or the paper? I, um, this is a Felix Gonzalez Torres untitled Last Night. So Felix Gonzalez Torres is amazing. He like let so much freedom for people to like decide what his work, the formatting would be. So MoCA actually, own, oh, so the show will be at MoCA opening next week, at com, or not. Um, but, but it's two um, pieces, they own two of the same sculpture. And since Felix Gonzalez Torres said, you can show it any way you want. So it, he gave the freedom for the person who was installing it to decide so many things about this thing. So because Mocha owns two, we'll show one like lit and one as a clump ball unlit because it's the same work, but it can exist in these multiple uh, forms. This is John Chamberlain Loan. So it's made out of urethane foam, which is non-archival and is deteriorating. And the conservation record says that foam is dirty and deteriorating throughout, possibly intentional to work. So in a way, this one is like a weird one that is like, do we know that it's getting broken on purpose or is just a material issue? Um, now the next four works are getting, are gonna disappear for different reasons. So it's like, th those, the first four were like on purpose and now these ones are like, you cannot control it. So this is uh, Wolken Lay pollen for, from dandelions. So Wolken Lay made these blocks of dandelion pollen, but it has to be dandelion from Weinhausen, Germany. So, so Mocha, every time they shows, they have to collect the pollen back because there's no, like you can't collect pollen that much in Schweinhausen anymore, who, who knows, no? And so in a way, it's, and, and the original one was this bright yellow, and now is not the color that he intended for anymore. So in a way, it's impossible to conserve it because there's no dandelion there anymore. Um, this is, uh, again, Felix Gonzalez Torres' uh, untitled Corner of Bachi. It's made out of 72 pounds of bachi chocolates. And so this piece is attached to the life of the company bachi because if they go broke, this piece will like go away, no? Uh, and so now Nestle bought it, so it's pretty stable, I guess. Um, but then it depends on, uh, Felix and Sasso has left these sort of stipulations that if you cannot find, if bocce goes away ever, then it can be replaced with chocolate that has international love messages, like bocce. But I tried to really look for another chocolate that has international love, multiple international love messages. So um, I haven't found one. If anybody knows, you can save this piece. <laughs> or have an insurance policy. Um, this one's a Richard Tuttle 44th wire piece. 
Uh, this one is, a, I love this, because uh, Richard Tuttle is 78 now, and the only person who can install this piece is him. So the piece consists of him coming, he draws a line on the wall, he installs a piece of wire, and then the, the piece is the relationship of the band wire to the line. But so this, we're actually flying him over to install the piece because who knows how many more times we'll be able to see it, no? Um, Next, this is, so I also was looking for which is the piece in the collection that will, that is like made out of the most, you know, fragile material, like it's going to collapse even though you, however much conservation wants to not uh, make it go away, there's no way. So uh, most of the Polaroid works that you know are going to disappear at some point, but I found that this Chris Burden uh, piece is made out of many, many materials that no matter how hard conservators try to keep it, it will go away. So, so the, the, the show will actually have the estimated range of time of different elements in the work and when they will expire. Um, so next section is, is, I was interested just like looking at the storage section. And so they have all of these materials that are not sculpture yet, but is waiting to become sculpture when something breaks or like replacement things. And then stuff that is left over from, so, waiting to be art and then X art, like we were art and then we're not art anymore. Uh, so this, we're gonna show one of the bulbs, a Dan Flavin bulb, which is waiting for any of these bulbs to go away to become a sculpture. Uh, and then a Dove Bradshaw passion piece, which is a copper plate that gets replaced every time. It's a copper plate that gets squirted with ammonium and it just drips. But every time that is shown, you have to make a new one and Mocha somehow has one, the one that was shown last time, which is not an artwork anymore, but they still treat it like an artwork. I was like, can I have it? They're like, no way. It's like, you know. Um, and so in a way it was how the, the building was even going, like an anxiety to preserve all of the things in the show, even though the direction specifically say like, it's over, you know, done. Uh, and then the final two is this, um, these two examples were, artists that were alive trying to negotiate the shape of their works, because this is something that was interesting to me, like how can I uh, negotiate with an institution to be able to change my works if I feel like it, or maybe, you know? So this is a Michael Heiser double negative. It's uh, the first land art piece to be owned by an institution. It's supposed to just, it's these two holes in the landscape and it's supposed to dissolve nature, do its thing, no? But now Michael Heiser is fundraising to fix it. And so it was like, no way, dude, like, how are you going to fix it? They're supposed to go away. No, so it was like artists going against their own intentional, in, in, uh, their own inten in, uh, original intention. Uh, and then, of course, the museum is like, we own it. You can't do anything. So in a way, it was like this conflict between the author and the idea and the institution and who owns it makes such a big difference. And like, how can you own it? So instead of owning, let's just be stewards. You know, like, yeah. Um, and then this Rafael Mortañez Ortiz uh, Henny Penny Piano is a one that we actually were able to change because the, so this piece uh, is a ephemera from a performance. He actually gets a piano and he destroys it and then by destroying it, he liberates the material from its colonial shape. But Mocha put it after in the collection as a sculpture. So I was like, by just the forms it made, an even bigger colonial shape on top of this object. And so now I was like, hey, Rafael, you know that your piano is a sculpture in the collection now, and is the wood, not, not the piano, the wood, it's in the collection as a sculpture, and he was like, what? And so in a way, it was just how the paperwork went against the idea of the original shape. So uh, the way that we sort of resolved it was that he was like, okay, they have it, how can we liberate it? And then in a way, uh, he, he said that to do that, we would plant trees of all of the wood that is in the piano in different spaces, and that would be a symbolic sort of um, making of the, you know, returning material. So yeah, so all of these sort of works that I've been thinking about sort of determine how objects will live in the future, and so it gives me a lot of anxiety as an author when I let works go because so many other things will become, will take my place. So at Radcliffe, I was thinking like, I'm gonna learn so much about the law because I want to really plan for how my works would exist in the world after I die. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>